And good evening. Welcome to tonight's broadcast of the Warrior Wallet. I'm your host, George Pardos, and welcome to the uh, Veteran Radio Syndicate family. So, I want to talk tonight about a couple things that um, have recently seemed to, to take over the, I don't know what you want to call it, the, uh, the conversations. So, one of the things that uh, we learned, and... Um, when, when I was a, um, a financial advisor, there was a couple things that we used to do. And one of them was we used to have this report that came out that used to talk about economic indicators. Now, the economic indicators were different. They were just some of the, the weirdest things that you could think of. And it was really interesting about when you start talking about economic indicators, it was really interesting about how they acquired them. And for the last, probably in the last 60 to 70 years, most of them have turned out to be true. There's some of them that, that were not, but for the most part, they turned out to be pretty real, pretty, pretty true. And pretty, uh, you know, they, they're, they're, I don't know what you want to call it. Um, they're pretty accurate. So one of the things that that a, a economists always study is they study the, the you know the, the job market they study the bond market they study the you know the stock market they everything that you could that is that can be counted gets gets counted I mean basically and they come out with these economic indicators and what is really weird about recently ha- has been is you know there's a lot of talk about the millennials and how you know that they're not you know that uh oh you know the millennials aren't spending money they're not doing this you know they're not doing this or you know they're not affording or they're not able to afford you know certain you know certain aspects of you know commerce let's just talk about that and you know you know some of them will go out and buy you know four dollar avocado toast which Personally, I think it's it's delicious, but when when people started looking at the economy as you know they were comparing the, you know this economy right now with Trump um, to the last two thousand six, two thousand seven, two thousand eight um, against you know what George Bush did, they had some valid arguments because one of the things that that is happening today, and I'm not talking about you know the last, you know even under Obama, but I, today. Is that we're we're starting to have a high default rate on cars. Now, one of the issues behind that was the fact that um, one of the reasons that you had a, a high, you're having a high default rate, or you know, that people are delinquent, is the fact that we gave out free money. Now, after 9/11, after 9/11, one of the things that had happened was that we pumped a lot of money into the economy. And the economy was was a, at a bad position because there was a lot of fear. Now, one of the things that that happens with fear is that uh, people do things illogically, and when they, and what I mean by that is they panic. And one of the things that had happened during the res, the depression, I'll give you an example. When they, there was a run on the banks to get their money, and people went crazy they wanted to get their money out so when the 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 government stepped in and shored up some of the banks they did things like triple count their money they you know so what they would do is they would get their when when they started bringing money to the banks what they would do is they they would take you know 10 minutes to do one transaction where they could actually done it in like five minutes and one of the things that that led to was you know during the the 30 you know the 20s and the 30s there was a lot of pressure from you know the the bad economy that's what led to some of the gangsters out there uh john dillinger um the um you know bonnie and clyde you know they they started robbing banks and it was part of it was due to the fact there's some economic hardships out there so why do i bring that up well today if you take a look at some of the economic indicators 
where people are starting to you know to to panic is pawn shops now why is that a bigger you know why is that a big deal well because pawn shops are the quickest and fastest reflection of how an economy is doing now one or two reasons a pawn shops are down pawn the pawn industry as a whole has dropped and part of that reason has been is that there's a lot of full-time employment now if you listen to elizabeth warren and or some of the you know uh, uh, alexander ocasio cortez one of the things that they start bringing up is the fact that oh you know people are working two jobs it really they're not they're they're not working two jobs because they're they're not going to I don't know very many people that work two jobs. I mean, some do, but for the most part, people work one job. And here in Columbus, Ohio, you can go get a job at $18 an hour. Um, you go to the Amazon, uh, you know, the Amazon warehouse. But here, here was the, the one thing about where people are making these jumps is that they think that there's a magic potion to fixing the economy or wrecking the economy, and there isn't. Most economies are driven on on two things surplus in cash and or consumer confidence those two things drive 90 percent of all the economies out there they 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 really do and and the problem with that is that most people don't see that they they really um you know they really don't they don't understand it so i'll give you a prime example if you are, let's say, a, there's six of you sitting around a, a campfire, and you have a log, I have a log, Brenda has a log, everybody's got a log, and the the fire, it, you know, we have a limited amount of logs, but if no one is putting a log on their fire, if I put a log on the fire, I'm going to run out of logs, and then all of you have logs, right? So the government sometimes acts as one of the guys around the campfire that starts putting logs on the fire so everybody else will put logs so basically if there's no consumer confidence they wind up um, not you know they they really don't put logs on the fire they don't put money into the the economy that that's a difficult that is a very difficult position for some people now th that is called money velocity now I've talked about that a few times Right now, what we have in America, and, and especially in the United States, um, and not just globally, but especially, in the, we have a lot of consumer spending, but we have a lot of cash that is available to go spend. So I'll give you a prime example. One of, my, uh, one of the people I do business with, and he's a, a lender or investor, whatever you want to call it, offered me some capital to, for, the, you know, for my business with no covenants. Now that meant that basically there's no, you know, there's no rules for paying it back. Just pay it out of cash flow. Um, he doesn't want, you know, the interest rate is capped, and he says here, just there's no monthly payment terms. It's just like just pay it back. And the reason for that is people are sitting on a lot of parked cash. Now, counter to what you believe counter to what is being told to you people don't want to hoard cash because it's it hoarding cash is the equivalent of hoarding let's say vegetables if you hoard them man it, it doesn't do you any good sooner or later they're going to to rot well the same thing happens to money if you just take let's say a hundred thousand dollars and put it in your safe yeah it's great for a rainy day but that hundred thousand dollars in a year is going to be worth ninety eight thousand, and the the following year it's going to be worth ninety six thousand two hundred. So you're going to lose two percent a year just by parking it. Why would you do that? Now, if you listen to the 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 left, they're like, oh, you know, these you know billionaires are hoarding cash. Where are you going to put it? I I mean, that's realistically that is one of the 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 downsides of how we look at the marketplace. Now, one of the big indicators that is that goes on today, and one of the best things that, ha that has happened in the history of business, was in 1997, 
um, it, and it was under Bill Clinton, and it was a great idea. It was they changed what was called FAS, you know, they changed a couple of the FASB rules. But one of them, that what they changed is capital expenditures did not go, or leases did not go on your books. Now, why is that important? Well, today, if a company like FedEx borrowed a billion dollars for its airplanes, that debt doesn't go on its books as debt. And that makes their books look a lot better. Well, one of the things that's going on right now is that we have a lot of capital expenditures in business where they're buying new product. They're upgrading their phone systems, they're upgrading their copiers, they're upgrading their computers, um, they're buying more phones, they're buying a, a lot of that. And that's an, ind that's an economic indicator that shows that the economy is doing much better or that there's a, a, at least money volume out there. And that, that is important because discretionary spending is, n for the most part, not always, discretionary income and discre discretionary spending is what drives expansion. Now, sometimes other, you have other factors that drive expansion, but for the most part is you, you have a surplus in cash. So if you're, I'll give you an, idea, an example. If you have, you just got done working for the week, right? You, you, whatever you got paid. Um, let's say at the end of the week you had an extra, let's say, $300 unaccounted for. You paid all your bills. You paid the gas, electric, cable, car note, insurance. Everything is paid for. And at the end of the week, you have an extra $300. You, you have the option of what are you going to do with that? You can invest it. You can, but that's discretionary income. You can do whatever you want. Um, if a sh if you go out into the to Polaris or you know a mall and you see a shirt for ten dollars, and you say, "Hmm, I have three hundred, two hundred ninety, yeah, same thing." I buy the shirt, so that shirt gets, you know, that shirt gets sold. Then you know what happens next? Well, you, it's the same thing if you go to dinner. Uh, you go to dinner that night, you have a hamburger, or cheeseburger, or whatever. Um, that person, you know, the waitress gets a tip. You know, the, the bar sells some meat. You know, you got to go to the Cisco to get more. And so it, it's incremental spending like that is always what drives a, economy, especially our economy. Now, if you are just uh, barely treading water, you're... you're you're not going to go out and spend. But for the most part, we have a, a huge surplus of cash right now. And the re there's two reasons. One is there really hasn't been anything in the marketplace that has come out recently and has um, attracted investors. And what I mean by that is that in the last few years, people have migrated to the same funnel, um, f basically FANG, Facebook, Amazon, um, Netflix, and Google. They, you know, the, that has taken up a lot of the, the marketplace. That's where people have migrated to. The problem with that is it doesn't show expansion elsewhere. Now, here's the second part about where you have certain expansion is in the medical marijuana business. Now, this is a, a, a very rough business to get into because each state has a different licensing. Like, for example, in Ohio, you have to spend like $100,000 just to apply, and it doesn't necessarily guarantee you a position. So, um, but marijuana stocks are now starting to be sold on exchanges. And that is... That's a good economic indicator that that shows that people are, are willing to, to sell that. So with that with that being in the marketplace, people are looking to expand commerce. One of the issues has been is we haven't had a growth in small business at at the rate that we need to. And there. I don't know why that is. I don't know if that that is it's social, it's political, it is, you know, the the willingness of people to take risk maybe you know their you know risk aversion has 
has become a you know a mainstay. I don't know, and it and it's very difficult to watch because one of the things that you look for in in the, in the marketplace is the expansion of small business. Small business hasn't grown. Now, not to the tune that they we're used to. Um, and I think part of that is, and there's numerous reasons. One of them being is that millennials are getting out of college and they they can't afford what was what was affordable to us. And what I mean to affordable to us is my generation. I'm 53. So I graduated college, uh, high school in 84, and then I graduated Ohio State in 1993. When we were at Ohio State, when I graduated, there really wasn't a lot of jobs. Um, it, it, there wasn't a, a lot of this. Um, 1993, we had just faced a recession under George Bush, and we had um, we had looked and, and saw that, man, it just... it it really wasn't as good as um, as we thought it was. And so if you if you get out of school, one of the reasons that I went and had my um, you know one, one, once that I got out of school, um, we looking for a job was difficult. 1993, I'll give you an example. the Marine Corps, and I had thought about going to law school in 93. Um, the Marine Corps had five slots in all of the Marine Corps for lawyers. I mean, realistically, that, that was how bad, uh, you know, everybody wanted to be a lawyer. That's why in, our, in my, my generation group, there's a lot of lawyers. There was a lot of lawyers. So when you, when you did that, you, you had a, you know, you had just a surplus of lawyers and now it, it's the same thing there's no um it, it there wasn't um as much uh you know there wasn't as as much of of some of the jobs so people didn't you know people opened up their own business i opened up my own company um wound up um i and i've done it a few different times um and it, i've done it a once well Mostly because I can't stand people. I really just, I, I don't, I don't, I like the freedom of having my own company. Here's the other part of it. I'm willing to take that risk where other people are not. And what I talk about when I say, um, you know, the pills and potions, there, there are businesses out there that seem to rise or multi-level marketing businesses. And that's one of the things I, I and I don't rail against them. And, and let me tell you. The, the great thing about multi-level, um, the, the great thing um, um, that is uh, the, about having your own business, especially about the, the multi-level businesses, is they are, um, I don't know how to say it, it's a great way to, to learn stuff. Now, the, the scam behind it, or not, I won't say the scam, but... It, yeah, it is a scam, is that usually when somebody introduces you to a, a great idea like that, is that people are looking at, you know, basically the, you go to a guy's house, you know, I'll give you an example, I used to be in Amway, you go to this guy's house and it's a beautiful house, it's a it's a mansion, it's three, four, five hundred thousand dollar home, and it makes it sound like he created his business by being an Amway where he really didn't. He did it something else, and he just does Amway as a side business. Now, there are people out there that do Amway as a great business, but those kind of businesses usually are attractive when economic... T There's two times that they're really a a attractive. One is when... Um, where, the, where times are really good or times are really bad. When people are looking for an alternative, now one of the things that happens, and my one concern about um, that I, I've always had a, a, a problem with is that there's some things um, 
and, and I don't know how to explain this without railing on. I, I, I try to stay out of politics on the show because I, I just try to inform people. But there are some there are some things that are driven economically that it's a response to our government. So one of the things that happens is when when you raise taxes, people shift investment strategy. So in for the last 15 years since roughly after George Bush got reelected, um, municipal bonds have gone down. Um, there's there's really not a lot of interest in, in municipal bonds. 20 years ago, 20 years ago, they used to be really great vehicles. There were some tax-free municipal bonds in the late 90s, early 2000s that you could get into for, and you could net, and I'm not talking about gross, but you could net 12, 14%. And they were, they were magnificent bonds. Some of them were railroad bonds, and they were great bonds. Today, you can't, you'd can't. you be lucky to get five. I, I mean, seriously. And the reason was, A, taxes are lower. So when you, you know, we haven't had really high taxes in the last, probably since to put money in other vehicles where you can make just as much and the offset is of the difference between a tax-free yield and taxable yield really is better on a taxable yield. Now, the reason I say that is that a lot of the things that I was taught anymore, just it, it, not that it doesn't work, and that's not the right, I don't want to use that term, um, but it doesn't, there's no advantages to some of the things we were um, we were taught. And it, here's the other thing. Um, some of the things we were taught aren't available anymore. And some of the, you know, the, some of the, the products that were being sold 20 years ago aren't being sold today. Um, I'll give you an example. There, there was a thing in, in, in Europe that used to be called Argyle bonds. And Argyle bonds were great, these great municipal bonds with a coupon rate and a surrender rate. They were a great financial vehicle. You can make, you know, five, seven percent a, a year on it. And, and it was stable income. There, there was no, you know, there was no downside to it. So part of that was there, there was, um, there was a lot of, of transactions. Today, not as much. You know, there, and again, it's because of the yield. Now, when you're talking about um, some strange. <laughs> so one of the economic indicators, and this is why I love America sometimes. A rise in alcohol sales. Th this is an economic indicator, and is a, a, a sh it is a sure sign of an economic downturn. Never understood that one, um, and partly because ma you know mainly if times are bad, people go to drink. And when times are good, people seem to drink less. And, and that is a, a weird anomaly. Um, one of the other strange economic downturns or economic indicators, and, and I, I don't like using this one, but it's really true, a rise, a sharp rise in domestic violence um, also shows that there's an economic downturn. And that is also, it's troublesome. Um, those are called coincidental indicators, and those happen every once in a while. Um, but here's one that is a really strange one. Um, in the summertime, um, if you have a rise in uh, July and August, it, you know, ice cream is a big um, ice cream is a really big indicator of economic growth. Um, if you have an above average ice cream sales in the summer, that is also a coincidental indicator. Um, you have more people going out and buying or going on vacation or, you know, or having a, a barbecue. Um, this is also why a bigger indicator in the summertime is grilled beef. So there's a, <coughs> okay, and I got to tell you a funny story because I, I kind of like using some of the stories. There's, an, a, there's a thing called the sh Chicago uh, Board, of, uh, Board of Trade. And this is one of the weirdest things you're ever going to hear. 
The price of milk is determined not by anything else but distance from their main office. That is what determines the price of milk, the distance traveled. And, and it's the weird, it's not on, it, it isn't on um, how, how the economy is doing, how much milk is being produced. It is literally, a, it is determined by the distance to a distribution center. And, and it's the weirdest thing, because it, it, but he, there's a, a room, I mean, not a room, but there's a bunch of guys in Chicago that just trade all sorts of things. Um, they trade, you know, if you guys ever seen um, Trading Places with Eddie Murphy, that's about right. They, they you know, they trade pork bellies. Um, they trade winter wheat, they, summer wheat, soy, um, sugar. Sugar's a big indicator. Um, and it seems that when you buy and sell sugar, uh, and, it, and here, here's how you buy and sell sugar. It's by the, the ship load. And so you have metric tons on a ship being sold, and you make maybe you know, 3% on a, on a load. But they, they buy and sell stuff. So those indicators, if people are grilling more, grilled beef is up. That's why there's, um, in the summertime, this is why porterhouses... A porterhouse, a ribeye, and a T-bone usually cost more. And if that price goes up, it's because people are spending more money on having barbecues. And that is an indicator of rising economy. Um, if you have um, a lower, uh, where beef is, you know, there's a glut on the market and people are buying eye of round or, you know, the flank steak or the, those other cuts, again, that, that's a bigger, bigger indicator. And that's why in the last, um, and this is, you know, going back um, to steakhouses, and, 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 which is an indicator. People, um, steakhouses are getting crushed in the United States, mainly because a lot of those, um, it, you know, the, a lot of the steakhouses are representative of, dis, of a lot of discretionary income. People aren't spending as much when you know when they're um, when they're afraid of the economy so I'll give you an example um, Jack Ruby's or where you have places like uh, Smith and Walensky uh, you know Hyde Park um, you know you think about Mitchell's you think about that those places are diminishing and here's one of the reasons why People are not spending as much in being gluttons, and I guess that's that is one of the the issues behind it. So, if you if you take a look at where you where you're going on, um, say you go to to, to I'm going to use Smith and Walensky because I go there every once in a while. Um, dinner at Smith and Walensky, a a, a bone in ribeye, six runs I think sixty five to sixty eight dollars. That's a very expensive dinner. Um, two of them, or you know, however, you're, you know, two of them, you're already one hundred fifty dollars. Add drinks and it, and everything comes a la carte. Nothing comes with the meal. So, if you just want a steak, it's sixty eight. And so, those are expensive meals. So with that is, you know, when you when you take a look at at, at things like that. Most steakhouses, is, you know, the business is down. Part of the other reason is we have a we have a shift in what we perceive in food, and and this is another part where I was, where maybe it's you know the pills and potions and stuff like that is we used to trust our restaurants a lot more, and. In the last, uh, I'm going to say in the last six years, a lot of it has gone on a downturn. This is why one of the things is that veganism is up like 600%. Um, a lot of people don't trust the, you know, the restaurants that, uh, you know, and rightly so. So one of the things that they did a report the other day, and it was really interesting, food that was being advertised as, as you know, I, and I've talked about this before, 
Wagyu beef or prime or choice or even Kobe beef wasn't. It, it was, and so more of the millennials are traveling to what they call farm to table enterprises, which is they, they know where they source the material from. And a lot of that food is, you know, what they call organic or, you know, non GMO or, um, and, and it does okay. But here's what I, what I talk about is that one of the problems that we have in our, that most people get wrong about the economy is that we, we are not following a lot of the rules that were good for 90 years or 80 years. From about 1930 to 2010, we had really good indicators. We really did. And, and I mean, from the, the Glass-Siegel Act of 19, um, in the 30s until it was repealed, we had a lot of really good indicators. After, after 2010 and after the... After Obama's first term, when he had to do TARP and get the money out, a lot of the, the things we were used to looking at in indicators have gone by the wayside. And a, and a lot of it is, I, I think part of it is the, um, um, I think part of that is the fact that with, um, he, my opinion, and, and this is my opinion, a lot of it is this, cell phones. I, I think you just can't gauge people on, uh, I, I think you just cannot gauge people on how they're spending stuff like they used to. And I, I think that is, um, th that is one of the problems to, you know, uh, that, uh, that it just, it, it gets waylaid. And one of the, and, and what I say by that is that we used to have really good grasp on how people spent money and because we could we could follow the banks but here here's the thing we've invented things like paypal venmo um the cash apps that you can send money back and forth that money is not it, it doesn't get counted like others so i saw a guy and god bless him i mean i i guess he's you know he says he only he does a lot of his business on Venmo and Venmo is a, a it's a phone app he's a personal trainer and he winds up doing I, I don't know how much he makes I mean he, he says he's averaging about a thousand a week as a personal trainer and, and that's about right but he doesn't use a conventional bank he only uses a bank for um, certain things he says 80 percent of his business is either on quick pay venmo or paypal 80 percent of his business now 15 years ago or 10 years ago prior to the introduction of the smartphones you couldn't do that yeah i mean there was no um you know now paypal's been around for a while but the you know the paypal cash app square and all of them weren't on so one of the 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 problems with that is with indicators is where do you you know how do you find them? And and that's part of the reasons why I think a lot of the things that people are saying on the news um, and what people are saying in, in the stock room, you know, in the, in, in the boardroom on the stock market are completely different. And it's because they, they can't gauge a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, um, um, they can't gauge a lot of the the factors that we were used to now one of the things that you know when, when you talk to people and you know we're, we're sitting there talking about um when we're sitting there talking about old in economic indicators um there was you know um the people looked at at corporate profits that were non-financial so if you take a look at a company like facebook which we're broadcasting on its profits are going through the roof why well because advertise you know people are advertising on it and they're making you know tons of money now if you take a look at that um 
one of the other things that you always looked at is industrial production. And that is something um, that when you look at industrial production, it should be, it, when it's in the positives, that is something people look at. Well, right now, we don't have as much industrial production as uh, we used to. And what I'm trying to get to, what I'm going to work on the last 10 minutes is everything I've set up to here is, is talking about some of the indicators we've used. In the, la in the next 18 months, we're, we're, we're going to have a, a really robust economy. Um, I can't tell you what it's going to look like after 18 months because it's, it, it, no one can. I can't. Trump can't. Uh, Elizabeth Warren can't. No one can, even after the election. Um, but for the next 18 months to two years, the, the way that our indicators are right now, we are going to have a re really robust economy. Now, um, the, there's a thing. Um, unemployment claims are down. And there's a lot of people on um, unemployment that are, are, you know, that are, um, they, they're, they haven't uh, filed as many claims. And so one, uh, um, one of the other things is, here's one of the things that it, to look at too. Um, you look at bankruptcies. When bankruptcies go down, um, you know that that is an economic um, that's an economic indicator. It means that the economy is suffering and people start going into panic mode. Um, here's a couple other things that you know that people don't look at, um, and it, this is why I think that we are going to have a you know for the the next eighteen months we're going to be okay. We have had a lot of what's vehicle registrations, and. Two things are coincidental, and there's three of them that are, are like weird, weird ones. Um, and it and it just um, for whatever reason they coincide a lot. Um, one is vehicle registrations, utility connections, and bank and credit union deposits. Those three, when you come. There, when you compare those, have been one of the best indicators in for 50 years. And it doesn't matter where, you know, how the economy was going up, the economy was going down. If you had a lot of vehicle registrations going up, um, and it didn't necessarily mean new, but used as well, people were buying and selling. Utility connections, people were moving, and if those things, if those indicators were going up. So, the one thing I will, I, I'm going to say this and to, you know, when I close is when you start seeing these things go down, it's time to, you know, um, buckle up because there's a couple things that are going to go bad. Um, the average days on the market of a home is another indicator. Um, it is, you know, if for any of you guys that are real estate agents out there, if, um, Usually, 90 days is kind of an average. 90 days to 110 days, or three to four months, it should be um, for the median home sale. Not for a jumbo or for a bigger, you know, property. But what you take a whatever the median home is, uh, price is in your city, or you know, whatever it is in a state, in, not by state, but in a city. And that median home prices, those homes in that, should not be on the market for more than 110 days. Once you get to th four months, that means it's a, the, the market is, is slowly, not, um, not exponentially, but slowly, that market is becoming stale or there's a glut of inventory. Um, one of the things that in, in some places, um, I've seen towns or, you know, where you've only have maybe 30 or 40 homes on the market, so it's a seller's market. That is one of the economic indicators that shows there. And the reason I say all this is because we have a tendency to, um, we have a, a another, you know, we have a tendency to panic, and, you know, we're more likely to believe bad news um, than we are to believe good news. 
And one of the other, and I think one of the other issues too, is that if you take a listen to economists out there, we have again we have a really robust economy. What what scares me about this is that there are people. Um, this is the only political part I'm going to say about this show. Um, there are people being left behind. And part of that is, and I don't think they're doing it on purpose, but we're, we started graduating degrees that we thought were going to be needed. And I'm not talking about, you know, I'm not going to rail on the social justice warriors, but I'm talking about real degrees that, um, that used to be really worthwhile and depending on who you ask to are, are not paying the bills anymore. Um, you know, there used to be a, uh, a much more demand for graphic designers. Well, right now, if you, depending on where you look at, um, graphic designing is down. Why? Because, um, with Photoshop and desktop publishing, um, you know, somebody with a computer can do just as much as not as well as a graphic designer with a degree, but can get a lot done. Um, actual, you know, actuarial science is always, you know, a very valuable degree, but other degrees that you would have think would have expanded are not. Architecture is down. Um, you can become an architect and, and you're not making the kind of money that you used to. Where other, you know, like um, hospitality services used to be, you know, um, you know, what I call the jock degree, those jobs are higher in demand. Well, why? Because we have more money for, um, le- you know, to spend on leisure. So, saying all this, I, I think that you have a, I think right now you have a, a you know, like I said, the, the economy is robust and it's not going to change for the next 18 months. Um, um, and... If you if you are looking long term, this is what it means for the average consumer. You're going to have a fight for your discretionary dollar. Um, you're going to have a fight for whatever money that you have tied up in, um, in you know for what you're spending it is. And I don't think that's going to change in the next four. In the next three to four years, I don't know what the economy is going to look like, but I don't think it's going to change much from the next two, um, unless we have something catastrophic happening. Um, even the you know the trade tariffs with China, China can't withstand a lot of their, um, you know, a lot of their uh, production. Um, here's why: we're one out of every uh, twenty-five cents out of every dollar spent. And, you know, in the Chinese economies from the U.S. Um, yeah, you can't easily make that up. I mean, yeah, you can make it up in some places, but not as easy as you think. So, in saying this, three things that don't believe what the, you know, media is telling you. Um, we're, our economy is doing okay. Um, and people aren't working two jobs. I mean, that, 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 that's craziness. But here's one thing to look out for. If you are a consumer, um, right now is the best time to buy certain things. Um, electronics being one of them. Uh, TV, iPhone, any of that, right now is a great time to buy one of those. Um, prices are, you know, are going to hold steady for at least the next six months. Um, the one thing I, I would, um, and the one thing I would caution you on is buying houses over market, which seems to be a trend in Ohio, and it, it's happened to be a trend in Ohio, um, and a lot of it in, in big cities. You're going to see that uh, people are going to pay um, above above asking for houses. Be careful about that because that's one of those things where you might have uh, you, you're going to overpay and you might not get your equity packed um, at least for a few years, um, and. You know, you think about it, if you buy a hundred thousand dollar house, even if you um, you you only have ninety four thousand dollars in equity in it, or ninety four thousand dollars in because six six thousand dollars is going to go to your realtor, so you have to make that money back. Um, so plus six six percent to break even. 
So, you know, your house at 100000 has to appreciate to 108000 just to get even. And that's not always the case. So be careful about that. Be careful about um, taking on a lot of debt that isn't constructive. Um, be careful with, you know, people trying to sell you stuff that, you know, just because you have an excess cash doesn't mean you should go buy it. And I've seen that, you know, it's like the, you know, the guys that are buying, um, you know, a, a Mustang at, you know, like, a, you know, you have Lance Corporals out there buying a Mustang at 28% interest. Um, they, when you have the money, they're, they're willing to do it. Um, right now, there's a glut of cash. So a lot of people are willing to loan you money, more money than you need to buy something. But at the same time, you know, you might wind up defaulting on it. And that's not really a good thing. So, I, you know, like I said, those are some of the the indicators out there. And I, and I think that what it's going to translate to right now for especially the next six months, if you're a consumer in the U.S., you are going to have a really good, um, you know, a really good set of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, markers out there. So... Uh, and I say all this because it is a uh, um, it is a really good deal. So with that, um, we have to log off for the night. And again, thank you for listening to um, the Warrior Wallet, and thank you for being part of the um, Veteran Radio Syndicate family. <laughs>